Thank you, Martin. Yeah, when somebody reads out all that stuff, you realize why you feel so tired now. Uh, for this part, I'm supposedly representing the recreational diving community. Of course, as you've just heard, I work for Paddy, so I can only really talk with any authority on what they do. However, I think it is representative to some degree, particularly because we haven't really got much of a recreational diving community yet for rebreathers. So really, this is just kicking off. And initially, let's define what we mean by that. But as you can see here from the slide, we've got the two arrows up representing the envelopes, with the recreational envelope traditionally being said to be about 40 meters, 130 feet maximum, typically 30 meters, 100 feet, and no decompression and no significant penetration. So it's a fairly benign envelope to work in compared to the technical one, which of course can go much deeper. And even if it's shallow, very frequently involves some form of a ceiling whether it's a real one in the terms of a rock ceiling or a metal ceiling if you're in a wreck, or an artificial one because you've got required decompression. Now, as long as you stay in that recreational envelope, it is possible to design a program which is not as demanding on the diver because you don't need to know so many ways of getting out of a problem. Martin asked us to respond to certain questions. What I've done here is put his questions in a paraphrased form as the heading for each of these slides, and I've tried to deal with that. So why are rebreathers important to recreational divers? Well, some recreational divers want to use them. They want to be able to use them within that envelope we've described um, for various reasons. And when we start trying to design a program for those divers, we need to be very aware of the capabilities of the diver in terms of what they can do and also what we can't reasonably expect them to do. Many of the rebreathers that could be available aren't appropriate for a diver in that situation. They're probably too complex. They have more requirements or more capabilities than that diver necessarily needs. And certainly some of the environments that are available are not appropriate for somebody who is a recreational diver. Significant overhead environments. Deep dives involving a lot of decompression are definitely out. How and why are rebreathers utilized by this group? Well, typically they're talking about no decompression diving to a maximum of 30 meters, 100 feet. So a relatively simple, benign envelope. And one of the beauties of this envelope is that the surface, and with all the large gas reserves that it contains, is not very far away. It's really close by because you don't require any decompression. You haven't got anything hard over your head. And so if you are literally within the envelope described here on the slide, it's 30 meters away. That's kind of like from here to there. So a huge reserve of gas is available to you just that little distance away, except it's that way, of course. So all you've got to do, all you've got to do, is get from where you are now in your problem to that place. And that's where the concept of a recreational diver will work. Because if you say if you limit them to that envelope, your training needs now can be significantly reduced. Because you can say, OK, all you've got to do basically is have a very sophisticated machine, which is very simple to use, in the sense that you can put this rebreather on your back go diving, and as long as you haven't got a little red flashing light in front of your face, things are good. If that red flashing light starts to appear, the diver's fundamental action is to turn a switch on the mouthpiece so that it instantaneously goes from closed circuit into open circuit, and then aborts the dive and gets out of there. And that's the primary thing they need to know that is different from open circuit. Now, in fact, we expanded the course a bit beyond that. But that is the most fundamental thing that you are doing now that is different from your open circuit experience. You've got that new operational consideration, what happens when things go wrong, and that's the most fundamental thing you need. 
In technical diving, of course, it's a very different environment. You need to sometimes be able to have a problem and then still remain underwater and do a significant decompression obligation. You still have to shift that. You can, of course, go to open circuit for that, but in many cases, the most efficient way is to go back onto your rebreather in a limited or reduced mode and still be able to use most of the functions of the rebreather so that you can carry out your decompression in the most efficient way. But if you're staying within the envelope I've just described, there's no need for all that set of skills. You don't need to be able to operate the machine in the semi-closed mode. You don't need to be able to manually inject oxygen. There's a whole range of skills which are necessary for the technical diver, which are not necessary for someone remaining in that recreational envelope. Because they have a very simple protocol for getting out of every situation. And by narrowing down the range of options they have, you can reduce the need for a large scope of training. So these people are typically doing multiple dives in a day, but there may be extended periods between dive trips. A recreational diver might do a dive trip now, then he may put his rebreather away for six months until he digs it out again, and then goes diving again. So you can't really rely on them having a big complex set of skills that they have to have memorized and have got instantly available. They need to have a fairly simple set of skills which they're not likely to forget. And to a larger degree, the rebreather is going to be looking after the diver more. So the divers are usually seeking extended time or silent operations. Specific training, well again, this limited envelope means we can limit the emergency options. We can then focus and reinforce the vital skills so that we can spend more time on those very few but essential skills the diver needs. Our approach in PADI has been to say that we require an amount of open circuit training before somebody enrolls on their closed circuit course. And one of our reasons for that is that if you remember the emergency skill for this diver when things go wrong is to turn that switch, go to open circuit and get out of there. So that's a potentially stressful situation. But because they start out as an open circuit diver, they're going back to their roots. In an emergency situation, it shouldn't be unduly stressful. They're going back to what was their original familiar protocol. But what we particularly have tried to do is to limit the task loading on the diver. And we designed our programs after having analyzed all the accident information we had at that point and basically said, here are all the things which people have typically done wrong. How can we avoid that? And in many cases, we said, well, what we'll try and do is, for this bulk of problems here, is try to engineer them out. Not us, but we basically said, in order for us to get into the rebreather training business for recreational divers, we need a machine that will do this, 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 and this to eliminate a lot of the task loading on the recreational diver. If a machine comes along that can do those things, we feel comfortable putting this in the hand of a recreational diver because we believe the resultant task loading is appropriate for a diver of that level. So are rebreather unit requirements needed? Yes, we would say so. We'd say you can't teach a recreational diver to use any of the rebreathers you will find. We need a machine which to a larger degree will look after that recreational diver and will take away many of the foolish mistakes that a diver may make. Because whereas with a military or a technical diver, you can expect a high degree of discipline and following strict uh, standard operating procedures, which may be quite complex in nature, you can't reasonably expect that of a recreational diver. So the unit needs to minimize the task loading on the diver. And that means a simple unit to operate, but a complicated unit to build. And if you think about it, you can buy a very cheap car, which has very little automation. Uh, the most expensive cars have things like ABS, traction control, automatic windscreen wipers, automatic headlights. The more simple a car is to operate, the more complicated it is to build. But it is possible to build cars with all those features. And likewise, it is possible to build rebreathers with these degrees of protocols. So we came up with the concept of a Type R rebreather, which is a recreational rebreather, obviously. 
and we said it had to fulfill certain requirements, and we're very pleased to see that there are already a couple of machines available right now, with several more uh, about to come on our list, let's say, of recreational rebreathers, uh, and they are designed very much with the recreational rebreather diver in mind. So are our standard operating procedures suitable for the wider rebreather community? Probably the majority of the more extreme divers will not be interested in our protocols, but some of them will be available and will be useful because anybody who's operating in a relatively uh, limited environment in terms of its demands would certainly find these protocols interesting, I think. And especially as well if they've got divers who are going to be very absorbed in a task and don't want to have undue task loading from the actual activity of diving, taking this philosophy and this approach does relieve the diver of much of that task loading and then gives them more scope to focus on the task in hand. So overall, I would say the recreational diving concept is coming of age. We're going to see that grow now. And that will actually be to the benefit of everybody because the significant thing about the recreational diving community is it's potentially larger, naturally, than most of the specialist communities, such as the technical diving, etc. And that means for the manufacturer's perspective, they've got a scope to make more units, which means they can spend more money on developing those, and there'll be no doubt technological benefits which then filter back to the technical and other communities too. So that's a little roundup of the recreational units. Uh, Martin, 